Welcome to the Climate Report. This is Hart Hagen. I'm here with Nick Alden. Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing great. Uh, so you had a, we're, we were going to talk about capital in this section. You know, different people have different viewpoints on capital and that kind of thing. I'm going to give you mine. Nick's going to give you his. And the way we're going to start it off is, uh, Nick, you had a, an environmental ethics class in college and your professor was obsessed with CEOs. So tell me about that. Well, I, I don't think it was abnormal for a professor at OSU to be obsessed with CEOs making too much money because they do make too much money. Um, but it was interesting. The focus was on how do we punish people for hurting the environment? But there was very little of very little of the new ideas or even the good news seemed to trickle through. I, I tried to get this professor to read Alston Chase. I tried to get this professor to read Al Alan Savory was apparently not palatable, not unkindly dismissive. He was just uh, dismissive. I, I came up with a name for him just to, to protect his anonymity. I call him Free Waterfall Junior. <laughs> because he reminded free, me of free waterfall he reminded me of that hippie from futurama the one where they go to pluto to the penguin colony and you know um it's not it's i it's, i don't mean it in a disrespectful way i mean it in an endearing way yeah but free waterfall junior was i i was told i should take an environmental ethics class because it would be good to learn about it and i was so surprised to learn how well, one, it's very socialist. Two, it's very, it's not, they would, re, they would on paper reject Malthusianism, but you can feel that atmosphere of people are having too many kids and consuming too much. Um, the thing I got out of the class was it was all about how do we punish people and how do we control people and how do we get people to value um, values that are made up out of thin air. And I just found it all so weird because um, we, we read a book about all of the world's religions and their environmental ethics. And it seemed to be trying to mine these worldviews and these religions for their uh, pro-environmental messages, not really caring, uh, one, about how destructive religions can be to people, but two, not caring about whether these religions are actually true. It was just how can we use people's innate conservatism to help us with this out? And I just found so many problems and I was later able to deconstruct it. But uh, I think the no impact thinking was a large part of why I couldn't get my professor on to new ideas. Well, it sounds like, you know, from the, from a big picture, from an interpersonal perspective, from a, why should I buy your silly ideas perspective? I mean, it just, it sounds like the professor did not like, make a case for why you should buy his ideas. Um, is that fair? Well, yeah, because you're making a case to me why I should not like CEOs and rich, the rich and building up capital. And I'm confused because uh, I thought I was getting away from that. But I realized, actually, what you're, what you're promoting, that's good. Because you have a broader perspective on what capital is and how it influences us. I mean, I don't well, understand why yeah. slavery is not part of this socialist package. Yeah, well, okay. So, you know, words, um, words like socialist, the, 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 to me, the ruling elites love to get us to play word games. And they, they want us to use socialist and communist and capitalist and conservative and liberal and progressive and radical. All of those are, are like football. They, they, they divide us from each other. They don't get us to think about the underlying reality. They just get us to divide from one another because the ruling elites can have their way when we are at odds with each other. Uh, and word games, and including religion, including politics, uh, word games are a way that they, they do that. But to me, like the big, biggest of the big pictures is like, what, what are we, what are we here for? Not just individually, but collectively, you know, seven and a half billion people we're going to, in order for us to, you know, save the, in order for us to be able to keep the planet a livable place, 
we're going to have to cooperate with one another. And that cooperation is called politics. We're, we're you know, there, government is a way of organizing <clears throat> power. Business is a way of organizing power. Uh, religion and social life and family life are a ways of organizing power. So the question is, what are we organizing power for? What's the purpose of it? And to me, I'm, I'm going to use an ism, but I'm going to define it. I'm an anarchist, which doesn't mean I believe in chaos. It just means I believe that, uh, that power is not self-justifying. If you have a powerful institution, that institution needs to justify its power. And, and it, it has the burden of proof. Government has the burden of proof uh, that, that it is governing according to your consent and toward a consensus. But, uh, you know, so I really forget where, where I was going with that. But, well, I but, think I know uh, what you're touching upon. If you're talking about burden of proof and justification and the word consensus popped out, build a fake consensus and then get the governments to do what you want is something I'm worried about. Yeah, fake consensus. So what do you mean by fake consensus? Say, okay, all the scientists in the world believe it, therefore you should too. Yeah, and they're not really I defining can... what it is. And, and they're not really, you know, anyway, so that's what, there are two issues there. One is, are all the scientists in the world correct? And another issue is, uh, what is it that they're supposedly correct about? And what's the, what's the vision and what's the call to action? I, whenever I get into a, like a, an argument with somebody and, it, and it's like, it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere, I say, okay, back up. What's the vision and what's the call to action? So the People that, uh, you know, the IPCC, an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they have this viewpoint that carbon dioxide is the be all and the end all. And, and, and that we have to deal with carbon dioxide. We're going to totally focus on carbon dioxide. Go ahead. They, they also focus on land use. Yeah, okay. I, I agree with your emphasis. I want to push back a little bit. Yeah. Lest we be accused of saying the IPCC only focuses, I don't think they're only focused on right. carbon emissions, but what, what you're touching upon for me is this. Um, I would never, Michael Crichton said, consensus is the last refuge for scoundrels and fools. And I believe that when I defend evolution, I don't say it's true because all the scientists in the world believe it's true. That's how I justify God. I'd say, well, all the, well, I, and I do believe in God, but that's different. Um, <laughs> I can, as a religious person, I can say the church fathers said this, so you should believe it too. But with science, that's not how it works. Science is about inquiry. It's a method of inquiry. And what I'm confused by is why we suddenly are defending consensus. What, what, and I think it's a sign that their ideas are weak. And even where ideas are good, you're seeing them being ruined. I don't like people defending evolution from consensus. It's really easy to tear apart. And I want people to understand that evolution is real. So what we're talking about here is powerful ideas that that are that get imposed upon us without necessarily carrying the burden of proof. So I think that, you know, that's a problem. Well, Hart, wouldn't the opposition say that we're just a bunch of climate change deniers? Well, that, that's one of those uh, words they want us to get. They want us to play word games. So the way I see it, the, the corporate, the mainstream Democrats who are at the center of gravity of the mainstream climate movement is the corporate Democrats. So the corporate Democrats uh, blame, they, they want to, they're always uh, pointing out how bad Republicans are uh, and, that, and that makes them better. Meanwhile, they're both participating in a lot of the same bad stuff in the climate uh, movement, they're saying, look at those climate deniers, how terrible are those climate deniers when, you know, they're, they're, when they're, you know, the, the climate movement itself is not, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm just saying, okay, so what, I, I'm not, I'm not concerned about being called a climate denier because I'm, I know that's not what I'm about. I think I understand climate better than uh, a lot of the people who are more vis who are the most you know the most visible people in that movement so okay. i mean just because i don't i think what you're getting at is just because i don't adhere to the official position the consensus position doesn't mean i'm clueless you know well you're right I'm and 
I would say though, the corporate Democrats, they don't really keep me up at night that much. I'm more concerned about people with good intentions and bad ideas. I have to admit that it's very disconcerting to me that people like Greta Thunberg and AOC, why aren't they embracing Alan Savory if they really wanna save the climate? Why don't they embrace nuclear energy? It doesn't make any sense. Well, they, I mean, that's an idea. Yeah, I like to talk about nuclear uh, with you sometime, but, but what, do you, what do you mean though, when you say, why isn't, Gre yeah, I agree. Greta Thunberg is one who, you know, I, I don't know very much about her, but I assume she kind of embraces this plant-based diet. Well, and, I'm saying you can't blame these corporate interests on these people. It's not, a there's something else going on there, but I agree corporate interests play a role in all this. And I'm always surprised how angry I'm getting at corporations, the more that I learn about all of this. But uh, let, let me just say that what I'm concerned about is that people like Greta Thunberg and AOC, very popular. Uh, they say we have 12 years to save the planet and they won't build fleets of nuclear reactors. Like if well, you are- nu Nuclear is a whole, reactors, nuclear is a whole different conversation. Well, I know. I'm just saying that if you believe the world's going to end if we don't decarbonize, then you be, would be, should be prepared to build a whole fleet of nuclear reactors. I'd also add that you'd be prepared to build a lot of wind farms. I, my objection to wind farms is they're unreliable. But it, when people say, oh, they kill birds. Well, if you want to save the climate, you better be prepared to kill a lot of birds. But the AOC um, and Greta are two different situations. I mean, I see AOC as somebody who just has not kept any of her campaign promises. She does not push for Medicare for all. Uh, she just pulls punches. She's just turned into a politician. So she's been absorbed into the party. She's famous. She's, uh, she's got privileges. If you're in Congress five years, you get a pension for life. She's just been absorbed by the, so I, I do see the corporate influence on AOC. She's you know, it's a complete disconnect between her rhetoric and the reality, you know? Well, you know, at the very least, at least I'm happy that there are, that we're able to manifest what we want. I don't like what gets manifested all the time, but it's kind of nice that, to know that at least popular, because here's the thing, all the money in the world doesn't matter. Ignorance is much more powerful. Ignorance and stupidity are way more powerful than money. And so I'm very concerned that if we're not informed about the environment and if we are using bad frameworks, like how do we have no footprint? Okay, let, let me, uh, so we started off this episode where we're going to talk about capital and the role of capital. Let me talk about what I think is the role of capital vis-a-vis -vis environment. And capital is, a, is a, a tool, a mechanism for concentrating wealth and power. We, you can imagine a world in which capital routinely gets redistributed so that nobody has a huge advantage over others. But our, we've got a world in which it's um, you know just the opposite of that. But, you don't have to be a socialist to think, wow, the, the wealth keeps getting concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. The number of people that own half as much wealth as the, as the bottom half of humanity, that number keeps getting smaller. So, uh, and all of our institutions, the federal government and Wall Street, the military industrial complex, uh, the, the media, the way it's structured, uh, all of these have the, uh, are having the effect of concentrating ever more wealth in ever fewer hands. So, and the way wealth is accumulated, you, you can imagine such a thing as natural capital. And you can imagine such a thing as social capital, but that's not how wealth is defined. So the wealth on paper, the kind of wealth that makes things happen, the kind of wealth that um, you know exists on Wall Street, uh, it, it's, um, it, it show me somebody who has earned a billion dollars, and I'll show you how at least 90% of that is, is not earned. It was extracted. It was extracted from nature. It was extracted from people's labor, and it's extracted from political institutions and things that should be And again, be you sound a lot like Free Waterfall Jr., my environmental ethics professor. 
No, I'm just, um, I'm just, I'm sharing some facts that should be. No, no, that, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing okay. with you. I'm saying okay. you're having a similar conversation, but you're also using better frameworks to understand things like holistic management. And, and so then, so then the question is, what is the solution? And to me, a big part of the solution is for us to actually have a free press, actually have free media, actually have freedom of exchange of information and ideas. And another part of the solution is, I mean, you know, not like I'm running for office, but I'll give you half your time and half your money back. I'll show you how half your time and half your money is, is going to institutions that, that do not serve your needs and interests do not serve the needs and interests of anybody else. I'm talking about on a per capita basis, we spend $5,000 a year on uh, the military on a per capita base or on a, uh, per car, we spend $8,000 per year. There, there's just these different expenditures that we have that it doesn't have to be that way, but it is that way because the people don't have the power. The power is, 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 held, is held in a very few hands and the people who have the power are the ones that are able to use their power to further increase their wealth and their power. So to me, that is the dynamic, that is the reality that is destroying nature. And one last point. So we're talking about environment, and you and I know about Alan Savory. We have studied Alan Savory. We, we're part of Soil for Climate. So we know that there is a type of agriculture that could be very good for the planet. And that, but that's not what we have. And the question is why? And you need to look no further than the big agribusiness corporations and how they control, they control the, those markets. And they control and just, the, the, the politics. The only thing I want to know part is why is someone like Chris Hedges not for Alan Savory? He said offhandedly, we need to go vegan. If you care about climate change, you'll go vegan. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning you know, journalist and he has he's very principled. And he's mm -hmm. saying a lot of the stuff you're saying, why can't I get someone like Chris Hedges or Noam Chomsky to get behind Alan Savory? I have had the very same thought. And I can only attribute that to the fact that not everybody knows everything. I mean, Chris Hedges and Noam Chomsky have both been hugely influential on me. They're brilliant and I value them very much. I've also discovered that they're not right about everything and they don't know everything. So I, the only thing I can, yes, I mean, I've thought about how can I contact Chris Hedges and orient him to what you and I know, and maybe that'll be possible someday. It's, it's about the spread of ideas. Yeah. We don't have I'm, a perfect I, I like yet. your optimism. I do. I'm just, that's why I address the impact in the last interview. That's why it has to be addressed because the bad impact, the, the bad frameworks, I think are a big part of that. And it all ties back into the money. It takes people who would be revolutionaries and it makes them end up siding with the big millionaires and the billionaires and the corporations. Okay, so let, that, that should be the topic for our next uh, recording. We're talking about the spread of ideas, the media. What is it that, you know, we, there are good ideas that you and I know about. Uh, how do we, and there are people who would be predisposed to uh, embrace Alan Savory and everything he represents. So what, why do they not, why are they not on board yet? And what might be a way of uh, getting them on board? Does that sound like a good topic for the next talk? Oh, yes. I'd love to do that. All right, Nick. Thanks for joining me. And thank you to our audience. Thank you.